once you've defined yourself as somebody competent and brave and part of the world, that is a great gift. And I feel like that's a gift that we are hoarding for ourselves because we won't give it to our children because our society has made us so afraid that we can't give our kids any of that kind of freedom. You're listening to the Mindful Mama podcast, episode 140. Today, we're talking with Lenore Skenazy about how to let our kids grow. Welcome to the Mindful Mama podcast. Here, it's about becoming a less irritable, more joyful parent. At Mindful Mama, we know that you cannot give what you do not have, and when you have calm and peace within, then you can give it to your children. I'm your host, Hunter Clark Fields, Mindful Mama Mentor. I coach overstressed moms on how to cultivate calm in their daily lives and create more peace and cooperation in their families. I've been practicing mindfulness for over 20 years. I'm the creator of the Mindful Parenting course, and I'm the author of the upcoming new book, Raising Good Humans, a mindful guide to breaking the cycle of reactive parenting and raising kind, confident kids. Welcome back, dear listener, or welcome if you're brand new. Welcome to the Mindful Mama podcast. I'm so glad you're here. I'm so happy that you've chosen to put me in your ears today, and it's a great honor. I really, really appreciate it. In just a moment, I am going to be sitting down with Lenore Skenazy, who is president of the new nonprofit Let Grow and founder of the Free Range Kids Movement. So, Let me just tell you a little bit about her. So 10 years ago, she wrote this column, Why Let My Nine-Year-Old Ride the Subway Alone? And it landed her on every talk show from the Today Show to Dr. Phil. And she founded a book and a blog and to say that kids are not in constant danger. And now she lectures internationally. She's been profiled everywhere from the New York Times to the New Yorker to the Daily Show. And as a journalist herself, she's written for everyone from the Wall Street Journal to Mad Magazine. Yes, Mad Magazine. Anyone remember that? I remember that. And she had a reality show, World's Worst Mom, which airs on Discovery Life. So I'm so excited for you to sit down and join me in this conversation with Lenore. Some of the takeaways I had involve about how we lose our perspective because of the fear-mongering media, and that actually keeping our kids always safe might be keeping them from growing strong, resilient, and emotionally balanced. And she has it in a really exciting way that you'll see about promoting independence together, which is so, so cool. So I cannot wait for you to listen to this. Before we dive in, I want to send a quick shout out to Nico and Casey for the five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Thank you so much. That helps our tribe grow even bigger and more people get exposed to these ideas and great people like Lenore. So thank you so much. Please leave a review. That makes a big difference. And before we dive in, I want to let you know that I'm running a free challenge. I'm so excited about this. I'm running the Unmartyr Yourself Challenge coming real soon if you're listening in real time in November. And you can go to mindfulmamamentor.com slash unmartyr martyr is spelled with a Y-R at the end. And this is for you if you know have some of that mommy martyr mindset, right? And in this free live training, you're going to learn to make time for yourself, speak your truth. You're going to learn how to destroy mommy guilt and improve your relationships and thrive without ever being selfish. And when you get started, you get this instant access to this really eye-opening self-care assessment that uh, people have shared with their partners. They've talked to me all about how it has changed the way they look at their lives. So go check that out at mindfulmamamentor.com slash unmartyr. That's U-N-M-A-R-T-Y-R. Now on to this episode. Lenore Skenazy, thank you so much for coming on the Mindful Mama podcast. Very happy to be here. Thanks so much. I am so glad you're here. I've been following your work for so long and your book, Free Range Kids, has so much to offer. I'm so excited to talk about it. But I would like to, maybe we should start with your story, actually, because your story about your, when your son was nine is just so, it explains so much about it. So, so maybe you could share with the listener your story. Delighted. So what happened is when our, our younger son was nine, uh, now he's 20, so it's been a while, 
he started asking me and my husband if we would take him someplace he had never been before here in New York City where we live and let him find his own way home on the subway. This was his dearest wish. So my husband and I talked about it and we decided, okay. And one sunny Sunday, I took Izzy, our kid, to Bloomingdale's fancy schmancy department store in a fancy schmancy zip code. And I said, okay, goodbye. And I left him in the handbag department knowing that that's right above the subway entrance and also telling him that it, that it was today. It wasn't like he was wondering, like, where's mom? Where's mom? He knew <laughs> that it was a deliberate thing and he had wanted it for God's sake. So I went one way and he went down to the subway. He obviously got home or we wouldn't be talking about it today. And I wrote a column about it in the late lamented New York sun, which is a dead newspaper at this point, but back then it was thriving. And it was, the subject was, the title was why I let my nine year old ride the subway alone. And that was controversial enough that two days later, I was on the Today Show, MSNBC, Fox News, and NPR, defending myself. And, and weirdly, defending myself after everybody sort of seduces you on saying, oh, that's so interesting. Why don't you come and talk about it? And I would. And then somewhere in the middle of the conversation, sometimes with my kid there, sometimes not, the interviewer would always get to the money question. They would lean over and ask, with dripping sincerity, but really with knives out. Eleanor, yes. How would you have felt if he never came home? And, mm. you know, that it still kills me, th that question, because it always threw me. It threw me for about four years. And then finally, I don't think I'm a quick learner, <laughs> put it that way. But it finally dawned on me that I never had a good answer. Like, oh, I got a spare son at home. Oh, you know, I'd be bummed. You know, I, I never knew what to say. But I finally realized that the reason I didn't have a good answer is because it wasn't really a question. They knew how I would feel if he never came home. Mm -hmm. and, and he had come home. So why were they asking? They were asking because I had refused to go to that dark place of uh, thinking, oh my God, I'd feel so horrible and it would be all my fault and for one day of freedom and fun, what did I do? I ruined my life and is and now it's all over and I, mm. you're supposed to do that and we think it's reflexive. We think it's just the mark, the hallmark of a good parent is to go to the very worst case scenario in imagining our kids doing anything, you know, walking to the bus stop, playing outside, eating a hot dog that isn't cut into eighths. We're supposed to go to that, that place almost prematurely imagine remorse and regret and infinite sorrow, and then come back to the present and say, therefore, I won't let him do it. It's just mm -hmm. not worth it. It's not worth the pain. Mm -hmm. And that has become sort of the defining path that we parents are supposed to take all the time. And I was just reading an article in Scary Mommy, a popular blog about a mom who was arrested and investigated for neglect, blah, 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 for letting her baby wait in the car for three minutes while she ran in to get a donut because she hadn't eaten because her baby had been up since four in the morning with whooping cough or whatever. And she was arrested and not just by one cop, but he'd called for backup because obviously here was a, you know, a witch. Oh my gosh. <laughs> right. And reading it, just outraged me yet again about this culture that has decided that kids are so in danger that we get to make up dangers. When there isn't a danger, we get to imagine, well, what if a giant eagle had come from the sky and taken the baby away? What if a lightning bolt had hit the car and you could have, you know, shifted it into reverse just in time? You know, what if a person that just happens to have been lurking around the strip mall for 13 and a half years waiting for the one parent, you know, who buys a donut for three minutes that they can, that the horrible person can run in, hijack the car and go over the cliff Thelma and Louise style. It just, we're allowed to imagine terrible, horrible, almost impossible scenarios and arrest parents, usually moms, for them. Mm -hmm. And then moms, therefore, are supposed to use those crazy ideas, those worst case scenarios, those movie plots as their guidelines for how to raise their kids. And that's sort of been the organizing principle for me is to keep hysteria and frankly, other people out of our own child rearing decisions. Yeah, it sounds really hysterical to me. But I have to think of the, the listener like we I have a strong interest in my kids' independence, but I'm mm -hmm. thinking about the listener who has mm -hmm. a two-year-old who, who says, wait, isn't it my job to keep my child safe? Isn't it my job mm -hmm. 
we're in this culture, we're in this, right, right. isn't it our job to, to think of those things? Of Why? Course. What do you say yeah. to the listener who, who says, okay, well, wait a minute, Lenore, what about mm-hmm. those things? Well, first of all, let, when we're talking about a two-year-old, your job is to watch that kid like a hawk. Two-year-olds mm-hmm. yeah, are crazy. They, I, was, I just, just walking the other day, there was a dad whose kid was on his balance bike and he looked like he was about two. And the kid zoomed in front of a car. And I actually was sort of mad at the dad. Here I was judging also. Like, you know, just because you're out here doesn't mean that the kid doesn't have to learn to start looking out for cars. That is your job. So I would say that, first of all, the job is to keep children safe. But our job is also to teach children to learn to watch out on their own and to to be aware. Maybe at two years old, you're not going to have them riding their bikes any, by themselves anyway. But But our job has always been to the, 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 the phrase is, since you can't prepare the path for your child, prepare your child for the path. And mm-hmm. I would say that is definitely our job. Our job is to teach our kids to have some wherewithal and to be safe. But the idea that we have to watch them every single second as they grow up until age 18, otherwise they are unsafe, that's what I'm trying to push back on. And one of the reasons I do that is because you're not making your kids safer if they never learn a little bit of street smarts, if they never have to learn how to cross the street safely, if they never have to learn how to deal with an annoying other person or, or getting lost. I mean, these are things that will serve your child well as they make their way through. And there is some concern that the reason that the rates of anxiety and childhood depression, and I hate to talk about it, but suicide are all on the rise on sort of a 50-year march is because when you don't have any control of your life, which is kids today, if they're if they are always under supervision and somebody is always helping them and you know and watching them and intervening, that is frustrating. That is a micromanaged prisoner-like life. And you'd be bummed too if every second of your work day was like, no, 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 let me do that for you. No, 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 that's not good. Oh, let me help you didn't do that right. Let me help you. No, I'll do it for you. That would drive you crazy. And I think the kids are being driven crazy. And so one of our jobs is to give kids gradual independence so that they do learn that the world is for them to encounter, not for them to have to need an intermediary all the time. So yay for safety. I believe in helmets and car seats and seat belts and mouth guards and extra layers, vaccinations. I believe in actual safety procedures. But the idea that children need to be constantly supervised is a brand new one. And we know that it's brand new because all of us who are parents grew up with some free time that children today don't have, either walk to school or to play outside after school. Yeah, yeah. I walked to school. I used to bike all around my town. I remember I went all the way, like two miles away to CVS one time to buy a big bag of M&Ms and came back. And my parents were like, where did you get that? <laughs> yeah, it's like all the way over there. Oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, so let me ask you a question. Why do, why do you think you remember that? Well, I remember it because it was pretty, it was the farthest I had gone at that point. You know, it was farther than my normal range and mm-hmm. it was exciting. And, you know, it was kind of a, a benchmark for me. And then my parents are mm-hmm. for sure. Yeah. I totally remember that benchmark. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I would say depriving kids of those benchmarks and adventures and ability to realize just how strong and brave and competent they can be to the point where they remember at 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years later, Jesse Ventura told me about a time that he had fallen off his bike and had to ride and, and hurt his foot and he had to ride home just using basically one foot with one pedal for the two miles. Here he is remembering it. He's been a you know worldwide wrestler. He's been the governor of Minnesota, but he remembers that time, just like you remember your M&M journey, the hero's <laughs> M&M journey, <laughs> because it's a definition of who you are. And once you've defined yourself as somebody competent and brave, and part of the world, that is a great gift. And I feel like that's a gift that we are hoarding for ourselves because we won't give it to our children because our society has made us so afraid that we can't give our kids any of that kind of freedom. And if we were living in the end times or World War III or it was germ warfare out there, I was just reading about microwave warfare out there. Okay, keep the kids inside. Go into the, to the, uh, you know, the atom bomb shelter. 
but it's not. We're at a 50 year crime low. We are at the crime rate that was in 1963. So if your mom let you ride to get your M&Ms, and by the way, she let you eat uh, sugar and uh, carbs <laughs> and God knows whatever, and here you are today uh, still standing, why are we not giving our kids that extremely important foundation of independence and I'd say joy? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I agree. I come from a background of putting my kids in Montessori schools, which are really independence driven, like from the very beginning, you can do a lot of things yourself. And that, that independence, I mean, I I guess when we look at kind of the underlying message we're giving our kids when we always fix their problems, or we always do things for them, and the underlying message we're giving them is that you're not capable, and, and we have to give them these messages that they're capable Right. Actually, it's ironic. It's something we don't give. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? I, we don't teach. And people say, like, oh, yeah, I know. But like, how do we teach independence? Like, well, guess what? <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's like, how do you teach love? Hmm. You know, remember, mm-hmm. at some point, you will feel big feelings for somebody and almost as if they are more important than you. Let's practice that now. We're going to write it down 10 <laughs> times. You can't do some things in a classroom. You can't even do some things as a parent. Some things have to be experienced by the kid independently, including, you know, the exhilaration and also the frustration and the fear, the anger, all these things that I hate watching in my kids. I mean, I just hate it. It is horrible to see my kids disappointed. And my kids are in their, you know, 20 and 22 now. And it's still, it's painful, but it's also part of growing up. So at some point you have to quit underestimating their ability to be part of life. You know, they're, they're going to get hurt. They're going to do dumb things. You did too. And to say, and, and the reason we're not letting our kids do these things today is because rewritten them as so horrible that they will never recover, which is sort of this basic undermining of not only our kids, but of human nature. We think everything is going to be a trauma. We think anybody who's traumatized will never get better. So if he had a fight with his friend, I'm going to call up the teacher and I'm going to call up the principal and I'm going to call up the counselor. And, you know, if something really horrible happens, I, I do say intervene. But for the everyday frustrations and fears and challenges of our kids' lives, we got to give them a little credit because then we step back and then they step up. So that's, yeah. that's all. And, it's, and yeah. it's so easy said and so hard to do. And it is really hard to do if you're the only one doing it. I'm going to let my kid ride her bike two miles to the CVS. Why are you crazy? Don't do it. I'll drive her. It's not worth the, 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 the danger, blah, blah, blah. So that's why Let Grow, my new organization, nonprofit, mm-hmm. is trying to get a lot of these projects done, a lot of these ideas into wide circulation at the same time. All the kids at a school do something on their own. Uh Schools are open after after school or before school for free play without adult intervention. You need a bunch of kids and a bunch of families doing this at the same time. Otherwise, you're the freaky mom and, you know, everybody's either avoiding you or dialing 911. Breathe. I'm interrupting the podcast to invite you to imagine listening to the ocean and feeling the warm breeze on your face. Imagine seeing little monkeys and smelling the fragrance of a tropical orchid while looking out at a vista of islands and endless ocean. This will be your reality when you join me for the Mindful Mama Costa Rica retreat next April. We'll be staying in a luxurious private estate, which has a view to the beach over the rainforest canopy from every room, as well as from the yoga porch and the infinity pool. Join me and other mindful mamas with each day designed to have a perfect balance of time for yoga, mindfulness, discussion, and free and open time so you can either make it adventurous, go hiking, learn to surf, kayak through the mangroves, go zip lining or more, or make it relaxing. Instead of adventures, relax poolside or wander down to the beach. We'll start each day with meditation and all levels yoga on the yoga porch. Every afternoon, we'll come together for guided relaxation and coaching and discussion with me. 
locally sourced foods will be served at breakfast and dinner by our talented in-house chef. If you want to get away from everything and take the break that I know you deserve, join me. We have limited spots available, so now is the time to reserve at mindfulmamamentor.com slash Costa Rica, or email me at hunter at mindfulmamamentor.com. That's mindfulmamamentor.com slash Costa Rica, or email me at hunter at mindfulmamamentor.com. I can't wait for you to join me there. Breathe. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's interesting to think about. So, so for the listener who's saying, well, okay, maybe there's some benefit to this. I mean, we can look at when you extrapolate out and, you know, I interviewed Julie Lithcott Haynes, who wrote how to, how to raise an adult on, on an earlier episode, which you can check out dear listener. But yeah, she talks about how in colleges, they would call the children teacup kids because they were as fragile as a teacup and they needed right. so much support. And so we can see that that kids are having been raised, it seems like it was like kind of, I guess, after I grew up, like kind of in the 90s and in the, the early 2000s that there was this, you know, this tendency to, to hover over our kids and bubble wrap them. And, and now they're seeing in college that these kids have, have more anxiety. They, they actually feel less capable. And, and I mentioned to you before we got on that there was a, an opinion piece in the New York Times this Sunday by Jonathan Hayde and Craig Lukanoff about the importance of free play and how the ability to free play has has been taken away from kids. We've we've taken away all these opportunities for free play. They're pointing it out as a a danger to our democracy. They they right. said that, that political scientists have shown that self governing communities and democracies rely heavily on conversation, informal norms, and conflict resolution and. And these are the skills that are best developed in free play. So mm -hmm. we are becoming a society that is, our kids aren't, they never have the opportunity to. They're not equipped for adulthood and democracy. Yeah, to mess up. They need right, to practice right. this stuff. They need to mess up and figure it out and, and have hours of, of doing that. And you can't do that when your soccer coach is always around or whatever. Exactly. So. John Haidt, one of the co-authors of that article, is one of the co-founders with me and Peter Gray, who's quoted in the article of Let Grow, this nonprofit I'm talking about. And so we all recognize that free play is, it's, you know, because play sounds like it's the opposite of work, anytime you want kids to, you know, get down and, you know, learn better and get higher scores, you think you take play out and replace it with work, and somehow the kids are going to get smarter. But in fact, there's this drive to play that is installed by mother nature and it's installed in every species. And I can't remember if they mentioned this in the article or not, but one of the things Peter Gray, who's a psychologist from Boston College talks about is, so all animals play and like a gazelle, gazelles go and the little young gazelles go out into the veld or whatever it's called and they, they chase each other and they, it, it basically looks like something between, you know, tag and hide and go seek. They're just running around, loping, or, you know, seemingly happily, but basically they have this drive to do it. And when you think about it, what they're doing sounds crazy from um, an evolutionary perspective because they're out there, okay? They're these little delicious gazelles wandering <laughs> around, you know, like a poo-poo platter in front of the lions. <laughs> Who can just come and pounce and, you know, eat a snack and that'll teach you, mom. How would you feel, Mrs. Gazelle, if you <laughs> never came home? So they're, they're out there in the open and they're wasting calories, right? So that means mm -hmm. they're going to have to find more of whatever it is that gazelles eat to, to make up for all the energy slash calories that they lost. And so why don't they just sit next to their mom? you know, with the gazelle iPad and uh, stay nice and safe and under a tree. They're not even in the, you know, they're, they're cool. They're, they're, they're protected, but, but mother nature forces them into the wild to practice the skills that they're going to need to really survive into adulthood, to be fast, to be wary, to be the one who isn't <laughs> eaten by the lion. And so mm -hmm. mother nature must think that playing 
they were doing what? They were playing tag, they were playing hide and go seek, you know, <laughs> is more important than just playing what looks like safety in the long run for the kids to survive. And so mother nature put into humans this, this great instinct to want to have fun, be in a group. One of the coolest things that some a play worker once explained to me is that the, the things that we're sort of driven to do are, are what we play hide and seek, we play tag, and also we make forts. You know, mm, yeah. Oh God, right. the forts. They're right. Crazy. Right. Well, you know, so if you were caveman, <laughs> what did you need? You needed to run. <laughs> you needed to catch food. You needed to hide so you wouldn't become food. And then you needed shelter. <laughs> so these drives are there because they have kept us alive. And one of the things they do beyond, you know, teach us to make forts when, when it's when we need our shelter is that they teach us to deal with each other mm. and make teams and throw the ball a little easier to the younger kid because it's stupid if you're a 12 year old to whip the ball at a seven year old. And it teaches the seven year old to not break down in tears if he, you know, strikes out because he doesn't want to look like a baby in front of the cool 10 year olds there. And it teaches all the kids to have to compromise because if you don't decide if the ball was in or out, then the game can't go on. So the drive to play, the drive to continue playing means that we start holding ourselves together and compromising and communicating and creating new ways of doing things so that we can keep playing. So that play drive makes us learn all the, the focus, the concentration, the, the, the social emotional skills that are really hard to learn. It's like a spoonful of sugar except it's play for learning the, the skills that you'll need as a fully functioning human in society. And when you replace free play with what you were talking about, the soccer coach saying, okay, these are the teams, you know, we're going to start now. This is, these are the rules. It's the simulacrum of play. It looks like kids are playing. They certainly are moving their bodies and kicking a ball, but they haven't done any of the real, let's call it work, <laughs> to, mm. to make the fun happen. And so they haven't learned those skills that I was just talking about. So the assumption of Jonathan Haidt and the reason he came to me was to start Let Grow was because on campus, the, the number of kids going to see the health counselors, the mental health counselors was going through the roof. I mean, schools were scrambling to hire more health counselors. And part of the reason is, of course, that it's less stigmatized today, which is great. But part of the reason is that Kids have had a concierge there for so much of their life saying like, oh, you know, you didn't do that assignment. I'll write a letter. I, I've done that, frankly. <laughs> and, oh, you, you know, let me help you with this. Let me get you there. Let me talk to the mom. Let me make sure that you're not unincluded. And what Peter Gray says is that, Peter Gray, who's also part of Let Grow, is that without thousands, like the brain comes out from the womb, and it's ready to be programmed by play, which will include lots of compromise, lots of exclusion, lots of frustration, lots of fun to keep us going, lots of joy to because it's so joyful to play. But if the brain doesn't get those experiences, it is, it is flaccid, it is unprogrammed, it is unfinished. And so you throw it out into the adult world, and it's like a baby, it doesn't know what to do. And so there, uh, John Haidt said, we really have to start, you know, if we want to have sort of mentally healthy, strong, robust kids who are ready for college, adulthood, and each other, and democracy, where it's a lot of back and forth and a lot of disagreement, um, a lot of debate and, and discomfort, we have to start young. And so Peter Gray came up with the idea of let grow play clubs, where either after or before school, the school stays open and the kids are invited to goof off, just do anything they feel like, like we would, except, you know, it was out in the park in the old days, but now it's at the playground. And you have there all the building blocks that you need that have been preventing play in the real world lately. You have, first of all, a bunch of kids, right? Because if you want to send your kid out to play and you think it's really good for them and you send them out and they're the only kid there at the yeah. park or everybody else is playing travel soccer, then they're, they're going to come right back in. So first of all, you got a, a critical mass of kids. Secondly, you have all these different ages. And Peter Gray, like I was saying, believes that age mixing is one of the keys to normal 
child development. You know, mm, you, yeah. you, you want to act a little older, you know, so you're, you, they don't want to act like us, you know, who wants to act like a middle-aged, you know, an adult anywhere from 20 to hundred looks really old and boring to them. <laughs> but a 10 year old, when you're seven, oh my God, to be as cool as him. Oh my God. So, and then you have kids off their devices, right? Mm-hmm. Cause this is free time. If my kids come home and this has happened, I'm certainly it's happened with almost all of your listeners. They come home and where is the fun? It's not at the park. There's nobody there. The fun is waiting for them on the tablet or the phone or the computer. So, so they're not on their devices. You've got a critical mass of kids. You've got mixed ages. They're at a place that parents trust, which is school. They're already there, which is damn convenient. And then there's an adult on premises in case of an emergency. So the adults mm-hmm. aren't stepping in. They don't decide games. They don't you know, solve any problems. If there's a bone protruding through the skin or somebody needs an EpiPen, there they are. But otherwise, I always like to think of them, you know, with the door closed, smoking a, a, a you know, a cigarette. But, <laughs> you know, the idea, it, it sort of solves a bunch of problems at once. Plus, it's after school care if you're working. Yeah. So it's so simple. And, and a lot of schools already have after school programs, but they're always, quote unquote, enrichment, which means that an adult is organizing them. They're teaching yeah. you or crochet or whatever it is. God forbid, Kumon. So this is an alternative and and it just requires two things. It requires the school to offer it and then it requires parents to do it, you know, to sign up for it. Maybe it's free, maybe it costs as much as chess club, you know, it shouldn't cost any more because it's the same thing, an adult there and then a bunch of kids. And then you just have to convince parents that trust me, this is really important. And now you don't even have to trust me. Now you can go to the American Academy of Pediatrics, which just published this blockbuster report that said, if we could, we would give prescriptions for play because mm-hmm. play is so important to children. It's as important as, you know, it's more important than kale. Imagine that. <laughs> so, it's above kale. So that's one of our big things is the Let Grow Play Club. And if you go to letgrow.org, which is our site, and you click on schools, we're always trying to figure out how to make it even more obvious. Anyways, you click on schools, you'll see the play club, and then you'll also see the Let Grow Project, which is our other big push, which I could explain to you after you interject something, because I feel like I'm just uh, monopolizing the conversation. (laughs) I want to interject that I'm going to be talking to my girls' school about this Let Grow Grow Play Club group, absolutely because I didn't know about it. And I'm, I'm super excited because yeah, it, it solves a lot of problems. So just to recap for the listener, like, so the free play, you know, it's building that independence, it's building that resilience, it's building all the social emotional skills. And I, as you were speaking on that, I, it really, you know, to me, you know, the kind of a child's emotional own emotional regulation is kind of like the holy grail of parenting. Like you can (laughs) handle your stuff, you know, Mm -hmm. and that emotional regulation, it takes practice. It takes failure. It takes, it takes being in difficult situations to be able to practice that. and, And they should be practicing that when they're young rather than, you know, than when they're 18 and, and out on their own. And then they can, you know, if they have an experience, they can come home and, talk to their parents about it. So right. I, I love this. parents. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I love, I love this idea. So some of these things, so I'm imagining, you know, the parent who's listening, who, you know, maybe currently, you know, drives their child the, the half mile to school and there may be, may not have a lot of free play in their life and they're listening and thinking, okay, maybe this is a good idea, but what about? And I just wanted you to because Let's you lay it. this you lay this out so beautifully in your book that about that a lot of things that it is actually a lot safer than our media makes it out to be. The world is a lot safer to I'm sure you've said this a million times. Now, okay. But I would love say it again. To, I'm happy to say it again. I would love for you to share some of the common misperceptions and the common ways that we think the world is unsafe, but it actually is safer than we think because of the hype. Oh, sure. Well, of course, the the favorite story of the media is of a white middle or upper middle class child who has been abducted by a stranger. Mm-hmm. And it's a very rare story. This doesn't happen a lot, but it does happen a lot in one place, and that is on TV. And so, you know, we can all name uh, 
kids' names who were kidnapped. And thank God that's something that my mom couldn't do because it hadn't become the go-to story when I was growing up. But now a parent who's thinking, oh, I, you know, should I let my kid walk to school? And then up pop the very easy to retrieve names of Elizabeth Smart. Elizabeth Smart, yeah, Adam mm-hmm. Walsh, a ton yeah. So here's the deal. Like Elizabeth Smart is what a, an interesting case because after she was found again, ABC hired her to be their missing persons correspondent. As if this was such a common thing. It's like news, weather, sports, and Elizabeth Smart on who's missing today, even though it is the rarest thing. But when it starts sounding like it's so common because you see it all the time on TV and you particularly see it on Law & Order SVU, I'm not surprised that we all lose our perspective because it sounds like it's happening quote unquote all the time. But my favorite statistic is if you wanted your child for some reason, to be kidnapped by a stranger in a law and order type, what they call a stereotypical kidnapping by a stranger and driven away. Do you know how long you would have to keep your child outside unattended for it to be statistically <laughs> likely that they would be kidnapped by a stranger? How long? Oh my God. I, that's such a funny question. I can't even imagine. Like a year? <laughs> Well, that's, that's interesting you say a year because it's actually longer than most people say. People think like, you know, three hours. Some people think 10 minutes, which is just amazing to me. If kids were being kept oh you know, every 10 minutes, it just weird. But anyway, the actual answer, number crunched for me by a British statistician, is 750,000 years. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> it's sort of like how many lottery. Yeah, I, I know, I know. I love it because it just, you can't, it's really hard to get to understand how unlikely the scenario that we think of as so <laughs> likely really is. But it's sort of like how many, you know, how many lottery tickets would you have to buy to win the lottery? But mm-hmm. one of the, the main things that is making parents so afraid is this idea mm-hmm. that the world, and especially America, is filled with predators. And nowadays, the, the big fear, and I, I keep a, a, a file of these, is, you know, that the kids are being kidnapped from Ikea, Target, the mall, the grocery, and sold into sex slavery. And I get, I would say I get a, you know, somebody forwards me, I collect these the way people collect stamps. Somebody <laughs> sends me a, a Facebook post. I got one, it was yesterday or the day before. Oh my God, I never thought it would happen to me. But I was at Target with my darling, precious children. I had Kaylee in the cart and Ava was holding on my hand. And I noticed two men staring at us. And we were in the I don't know, the Tide aisle. Then we went one aisle over to look at dish detergent and who should be there but the same man. And then it goes on and on and on. It says, I was so scared, my heart was pounding, but I have no doubt that they were there to sex, kidnap and sex traffic my children. There was a car outside. They had the door open. You know, they were just waiting and they didn't really seem like they were shopping. There was only one item in their cart. And so I know that's what their nefarious plan was. But reader... I stared them down. <laughs> you, yay! And it's like, but this is just, I share this only because we came so close. And I want all you mamas to be aware that this could happen to you too. And I'm like, this could happen to you. You could be at the store in a place where there were also men shopping, but not for a lot of stuff, who appeared twice in one day in the same aisle as you. Yes, that could happen to you. But as far as your kids being kidnapped and sold into sex slavery or whatever they do to get you into sex slavery, I'm not exactly sure of the mechanics of it, but I called the head of the Crimes Against Children Research Center. All they do is research crimes against children. It's at the University of New Hampshire. This guy's been doing it since the 90s. His name is David Finkler. He's a professor. And I asked him, how many children have been taken from their parents in a public place, like a, you know, a store or a mall or grocery, whatever, and, uh, you know, sold or somehow put into sex trafficking. And he said the number was, Mm. once again, you have to guess. Oh, God. All right. How many in America have been? Taken from their parents in a public place and and put into sex trafficking. Like in a year? Or (laughs) this is a tough question. Uh, Uh, Let's let's say 10 years. Okay. Okay. Uh, 300. Zero. Oh, wow. Zero. <laughs> wow. By the way, as long as we're talking zero, how many kids have been poisoned by a stranger's candy on Halloween? It's zero. So we get these ideas because they are so upsetting and, and exciting 
and awful and horrifying and they make us outraged and in our outrage and our zeal to protect our children we press send and we share that story with somebody else saying oh my god did you hear about this this was in kansas oh my god did you hear about this this was in wyoming this is right near me in texas tell you know mamas hold your babies close and we all we're doing it, I think, with good intentions. I mean, I'm not actually sure why the people write those posts, but I think they are shared with good intentions. And then the word goes round the world that, you know, I mean, you think 300, which would mean 30 a year, which certainly doesn't happen. So, wow. So, listener, really you and I like together, you. I'm sorry, I did speak over you, Lenore, but I, I really think this is so vital that, you know, we've got to create a culture that interrupts this culture of fear. And so, dear listener, like you and I, like we need to decide right now to get on and debunk some of those zero in 10 years, zero in 10 years that has, has that actually happened. So this is a really valuable, valuable conversation for me, Lenore, to just even get grounded in these facts. Yeah. I mean, it, it bums me out that that these are surprises. I mean, and they were sort of surprises to me too. I mean, I'm a reporter by trade. And so I've always, you know, sort of done a lot of research, but I, I too didn't know it was zero until I talked to the guy. So, mm. uh, so that's one of the reasons that we do hound and arrest moms who let their kids, their eight year old walk outside, with, you know, take a walk the dog, which was a story a couple weeks ago, or let their kid wait in the car for three minutes or let them walk home from the park. If you really do think that kids are being snatched helter-skelter, well, then it would be irresponsible to give your kids any kind of freedom because it would be like letting them take a vacation in Syria. I mean, that'd be a bad idea. But you're not talking about that. You're talking about letting your kids be part of the world as you were in times that are at least as safe and actually more safe than when you were growing up, unless you're over 60. This is wonderful. So thank you so much, Lenore, for checking this stuff. Like we need this so desperately. So as we work up to more independence, kids can have more resilience. They develop social emotional skills. They develop street smarts. They develop develop confidence. I mean, I know I was a really pretty free range kid. I obviously I did my big CBS (laughs) trip, but I mean, and I had, you know, I know how to get around a place and I I have a lot of confidence on, on how to take care of myself. So so we want our kids to develop these things, but say for the listener who may have, you know, may had their child pretty sheltered, was worried about a lot of things. How do we, how do we work kids up to, to more independence? What are some things that we can do to help, you know, individual families? Like I think what you're doing with Let Grow and, and doing playgroups and getting a lot of people together is awesome. But how can someone start, say, tomorrow who's listening right now? Yeah, that is a good question because I do think it's hard to do on your own. I'm going to tell you a little bit about our uh, our project that is in schools, and then I'm going to tell you how you can adapt it to just being an individual doing it. Sure. So, right. so the Let Grow project, you know, all we have are these two initiatives in schools. One is that play club we were talking about, but the Let Grow project is even simpler, <laughs> and it takes zero money or time on the part of the school. Well, maybe it takes 10 minutes on the part of the school. But teachers tell their kids to go home and ask their parents if they can do one thing on their own that they feel ready to do that they haven't done yet. And to that end, if you go to letgrow.org and you go to schools and you look up the Let Grow project on that page and you click on it, then you get this, there, there's all these materials that you can get. And one of them is a list of Let Grow project things that your kid might want to do. And they're roughly arranged from super simple to harder, like from, you know, make a sandwich or play in the front yard to have a picnic, to go to the store and get the ingredients for a cake and come home and bake it yourself. So you know, anywhere on that continuum is something that your kid will want to do. And maybe they circle a bunch of them. And then you talk about it with them and you decide which one it's going to be. Maybe it's going to be you're going to walk to the bus stop by yourself tomorrow. And then because everyone else in the school is doing it, you don't feel like you're the crazy mom who is risking, you know, death and uh, arrest by letting your kid walk to the bus stop. Or maybe because everybody else in the school is doing it, You know, you call up the other mom or the kid calls up the other kid and two kids decide that that's what they're going to do for the project. So they do it together. And what's amazing is your kid goes to the store and gets their M&Ms. Let's just say, theoretically, that that's (laughs) the thing they choose to do. Bye-bye. I don't know. Let's just say. 
And they come home, and as much as the child is changed and exhilarated and proud, the parents change more. The parents, I mean, you don't know what your parents were feeling then, but seeing that, like, this is the kid I raised, and look at what she can do, and she's blossoming, and she's growing up, and she's part of the world, and I watch people. I did a whole television series based on giving kids independence and then having them come back to the parents, and I watched the parents react almost as if they were insane. The amount of joy that would radiate from them upon seeing their kids <laughs> do something independently had, I thought, was wildly out of whack with the silly little thing that their kid had done, like, you know, gone down the street, had a play date and come back. And it took me once again, a long time to figure out why they were so happy. And I originally thought they were proud because they'd made a decision and their kid survived. I thought it was just the survival thing. <laughs> you know, like, look at, she went, she got the M&Ms and she's back. <laughs> so, but then, then I went to a lecture about mortality and it changed my perception in that I think that what the parent is feeling, whether they realize it or not, is very evolutionarily deep because it's, it's biological. What you're realizing when you see your kid go and get some, procure some nourishment without you doing it, is that they are going to be able to survive without you. And mm -hmm. until you give your kid that independence to let that happen so you can see it, you don't know, you know, all you know is your kid is going to be fine so long as you're there, but you're not going to be there forever. And as parents, you have your children, so they will survive after you are long gone. And you need some proof that, you know, the great chain of life is going to go on. And your proof is you walking through the door with the M&Ms. So the parents, when we've done surveys of the parents afterwards, their anxiety levels go down. Their mm -hmm. eagerness to give their kids new freedom goes up. Their pride is off the charts. Their joy is off the charts. And so to do the Let Grow project, change it, it, it breaks the ice. It really is so transformational. And at a couple of the schools where we were doing it this past year, I always thought it was a one-shot deal. Have your kid do one thing. Ride your bike once to the, you know, CVS, get the M&Ms, come back, you're done. But at so many of the schools, the kids started saying, like, you know, what, am I, what are you going to do next? I'm going to go do, I'm going to have a picnic. Oh, can I come? And then the parents were saying, what are you doing next? And they were bragging to the principals. And the teachers were excited because the kids seemed much more independent and almost more eager to raise their hands in class. And it really, you could feel a difference. And so a bunch of schools have started doing it once a month or even once a week. And so... If you're going to have something that you're going to propose to your schools, propose that because that doesn't even take any teacher after school watching the Let Grow Play mm -hmm. Club. It's just mm -hmm. that. But if you don't, if you're, if you're homeschooled, do it with your homeschool group. If you can't get your school to do it and you're not homeschooled, do it yourself. Go to letgrow.org, click on schools, click on the Let Grow project and download. It's free. Everything's free on our site. The, the list of ideas and, and, you know, give it to your kid and say, okay. Tomorrow. And, you know, it's easier if you do it with another friend, if mm -hmm. you have somebody in the neighborhood or if you have your sister or your cousins, they're willing to do it, you know, your neighbor. I would recommend trying to do it with somebody else so it's just a little easier for everybody. Mm -hmm. But really what, what breaks the cycle is action, not just mm -hmm. listening to you and me and this great podcast and thinking, oh, that makes <laughs> a lot of sense. You really have to have your kid do something without your eyes on them. And you'll be... You know, you have to write to me. Oh, also, you have to call it a let grow moment. We're trying to get a label on this to inspire other people. So do hashtag let grow moment. And then you share it. And that inspires everybody who's reading your Facebook posts to go, wow, that looks so fun. Look how happy she is. Oh, my God, she caught a fish, you know, <laughs> or, or cold. The point is, do it, share it. And I think that's how we're going to start renormalizing the idea that kids can have some independence. And it's not a crazy idea. Oh, I love this. I'm totally going to do this. I'm going to do this. Listener, please do this with me. And you can include me in on the hashtag. If you put your let grow moment on Instagram, you can do, tag at Mindful Mama Mentor and, and let me know that you, you heard it on the Mindful Mama podcast. That's so cool. That was so, cool. so this is awesome. So you are part of a shift. You're part of a shift away from this 
bubble wrapped childhood so that our kids can have this independence and, and things like that. I'm really grateful, Lenore, for the work that you're doing. I'm really grateful that you shared your story of the of your nine year old on the, <laughs> on the subway and caused all that controversy because you know we need to push back against this. We need to stop you know arresting our parents and and creating fear in parents. And we have to we really have to change. So. I hope that we can all be part of this. And I, you know, I just want to thank you for, for the work that you've done on this over so many years. It it really is making a difference. A lot of years. (laughs) (laughs) I know. It's funny. I looked at, you wrote Free Range Kids in 2009. So it's been, it's 2018 now. So it's been nine years now. Have you seen a shift? Have you seen any yeah, shifts? Yeah, yeah. You know that Utah passed the free range parenting law in March, which says you can't arrest parents for letting their kids walk outside, play outside, wait briefly in a car, or come home with a latch key. So now I'm trying to get other states to pass it because you know parents shouldn't have to second guess trusting their kids and trusting their community, trusting their own parenting. So you know, hoping that other states will pass that. But really, if you have a whole school doing this or a whole group of kids doing it one way or another, it just normalizes itself. I mean, the the law is just another way to remind the world that this is not crazy to let your kid ride their bike to, you know, to the store or wherever. So I thank you. This was a fun podcast. And I actually, I I do a lot of podcasts, but this is one I really want to promote. (laughs) I got out all my points that I really wanted to to say. And I I think that's because you're a good interviewer. So thank you. Oh, gosh. Thank you. Now I'm blushing. (laughs) Thank you so much, Lenore. All right. Thank you. And thanks, listeners. And write to me. I'm Lenore at Let Grow. What am I at? Lenore at LetGrow.org. Yeah, sorry. Awesome. Great. Okay. And we'll put all that in the show notes at the Mindful Mama podcast. We'll put links to Let Grow and maybe we'll start our own Mindful Mama Let Grow project. We That'd can, be we can so have some cool. talk yes. about it in the, the Mindful Mama Facebook group. I love that. So thank you again. This has been a lot of fun. Thanks. And um, now I'm going to be mindful all day. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, I hope you liked this episode with Lenore Skenazy. I love Lenore. She's a real inspiration to me. And I'm so excited about the Let Grow campaign. So let's talk about this in our conversations about this podcast. Like, what can we do to let our kids grow a little bit more? So I can share some of the things that I have done as a big promoter of independence in my kids to let them grow. And I want to hear what you're doing too. So check that out over in the in the Mindful Mama Mentor Tribe on Facebook. And you can find out more about that at mindfulmamamentor.com. And you'll definitely meet more of the tribe when you join the uh, free live challenge we're doing for the Unmartyr Yourself Week. And you can go to mindfulmamamentor.com slash unmartyr to go there and join. And you'll learn all about speaking your truth, making time for yourself, destroying mommy guilt. It's going to be so much fun. And we're doing this before we, as we lead up to our group coaching enrollment and registration. And group coaching is a really powerful five-month experience. You get to join a group of mamas who are dedicated to totally transforming their lives in so many different ways. I had one mom in our last session tell me that the work that she had done with this group made more changes in her family than five years of therapy. So I don't can't say that's the same for every single person, but this it is a very powerful group and it is really a powerful motivator to get yourself with other people who are doing the same work and investing in yourself to do that. So you can find more about that at mindfulmamamentor.com slash group coaching. And if you're curious to get a little taste, join the Unmartyr Yourself Challenge at mindfulmamamentor.com slash unmartyr, U-N-M-A-R-T-Y-R. And you'll get started right away with this very eye-opening self-care assessment. So thank you so much for listening. I'm wishing you a beautiful week. I'm wishing you some independence and some relaxation from worries and things like that. So sending out lots of love your way. Thanks so much for connecting with me here today. Namaste. Thank you to DJ Taz Rashid for this wonderful song, Inspiration Drive. 
go ahead and download his album, Live in Love, on Apple Music or on Spotify or wherever you listen to music. <laughs> 